um, Nelson Mandela University in Quebec. Um, we are friends and neighbors, so welcome, uh, Professor Kralin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Professor Kralin has been working for five or more years on an incredible program that really does create creative solutions. And that is what SciFest Africa is most interested in this year. Our theme is creative science, and we are exploring through a series of webinars, quizzes, workshops, and other activities, everything to do with creativity, innovation, education, in all fields of science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, innovation, and of course, entrepreneurship. So it's a very interesting program. We're with you from October um, until the end of March. And in essence, Professor Kralin joins us today to talk about an incredibly innovative solution uh, that he and his team at um, the university have come up with to begin to deal with a significant challenge that we face in South Africa, which is in spite of infrastructure deficits at schools, which I think are very well documented and very well known, how can we prepare our next generation for the fourth industrial revolution? And um, together with honors student Brian Batterson has developed an incredibly innovative technique to engage with a new language, which as a non-digital native, um, I am slowly but surely introducing myself to coding. And fundamentally, it is becoming a more and imp more important skill amongst everybody in our current economy. And of course, if we are to prepare young people and uh, upskill people for the new realities of what a technology enabled world will bring, it's a fundamental skill. So, Professor Kreling is not only an innovator, but he is also a developer. Um, this is a man who has raised substantive money and provided a numerous bursary opportunities for students to, to learn and have opportunities for education. And if you were imagining the scale of what these initiatives have done, just in 2021, over 25,000 learners have been reached by this incredible project. So we are so proud to have you with us, Professor Hreling. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And we are looking forward to hearing from you. Everybody that's with us today, please use the Q&A function to drop us questions and comments. We'll uh, hear Professor Hreling and then we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for a chat afterwards. So off you go, Prof, the stage is yours. Thanks, thank you very much for, for joining. Maybe just a correction, the 25,000 is in the past four years. I don't want to take credit for something that we didn't do. Um, it's, it's really a privilege for me to talk to everyone here this afternoon uh, on something that, have, that has been my passion now for the past four years. Um, I kind of feel I'm doing this full-time and my other job part-time, but I'm trying to do both full-time. So if you give me time, I'm just going to uh, start sharing my screen. And then we can have a good interactive discussion afterwards. Okay. So the, the topic uh, I've chosen for this afternoon and is kind of cheeky, but uh, hopefully we can have a good debate afterwards, is unplugged coding, why, is, why schools do not need computers to teach coding. Uh, I just need to mention the YES project, the logo there in the middle. This has been part of a bigger collaborative project between our university and academics in Namibia, Mozambique, and Germany. So a lot of the work that we've been doing, especially this year, have been funded through this international research project. So the first question I, I want to answer is why should all schools, and I want to emphasize the concept of all schools, be teaching coding? And the first one is it's not to produce software developers. Uh, we're not teaching coding, especially at primary school, but even up to grade 12. 
Our purpose is not to produce people that can write fancy code, uh, that can go into industry and become software developers. I, I really don't think that is the role of a school and especially a primary school. Uh, so I, I'm saying this to put in context what the rest of my talk is about. But it is important. Uh, software, software development or the skill of being a software developer, I would rate as one of the top three scarcest skills in South Africa at the moment. Uh, we are simply not producing enough software developers at this stage. COVID has, uh, has caught, caused a, a spike, which is not calming down, it's just carrying on. So the country's economy and probably the most of the world is needing more and more software developers and we're not producing enough. By far, there's a desperate shortage. So it's important for me that learners, whether they sit in one of the fancy schools in Santon or in a school up in a mountain, are aware of software development and are aware of this career. So we need to make them aware of the opportunities in programming or software development. There's many lists of skills that people have identified for the fourth industrial revolution. And this is just one of them. And without going through all of them, the ones that have bold faced creativity, creative, critical thinking, problem solving, active learning, decision making, communication, technology skills. They are all directly related, not necessarily to coding, but to the project that I'm going to talk about today. And coding is just one mechanism. So coding is not the aim. Coding is one of the tools to teach these uh, skills that we need for the fourth industrial revolution. Now, this is the one that, that I'm ask, um, I might have some debate with afterwards. Why should schools not use computers to teach coding? This is kind of the opposite of what one would think. Um, Everyone's running around to try and find labs, etc. So I'm saying, why should schools not use computers to teach coding? And th this is based on, on the, I want to start with a draft uh, curriculum that was published end of March. I think many of us in the education sector, and especially in my discipline, are very aware of this curriculum. I know I was sitting at Cape Town Airport when someone from DVE WhatsApp it to me and said it's been published this afternoon and I was very excited starting to read it. But when I reached this paragraph, uh, I really became despondent. Uh, and this paragraph is in all the curricula. Coding in robotics requires learners to work in pairs and individually on computers during contact time. The coding and robotics laboratory should provide for the following minimum hardware specs for computers. Now I'm not gonna go through all the detail, uh, and I kind of said to myself, who are we going to reach with this curriculum? A, a school with a fully equipped laboratory. There's even talk of, of 3D printers, et cetera, in the curriculum. When we know this is the reality of South Africa, 16,000 of our 25,000 schools do not have computer laboratories. And I think you are very aware that many of the schools that do have computer laboratories have dysfunctional computer laboratories because they don't have staff to maintain them, et cetera, et cetera. So if we build into the curriculum, the only way of presenting this curriculum is for a school to have a computer laboratory. Where are we going? The latest uh, stats I saw is that the the government needs on average a million rand per school to give them a connected lab, a lab that's connected to the internet. And that's part of the curriculum connected to the internet. So that's 16 billion rand. So let's all agree, this is not gonna happen. Um, if uh, I, I, I'm saying this categorically, this is not gonna happen. Um, I often hear scratch, uh, they call it block coding. Brilliant package. If you can use it, go for it. Uh, I'm not against Scratch. Uh, but Scratch needs a lab, needs a computer, and the latest Scratch, I think, needs a connected lab. So again, where does that leave the 16,000 schools that don't have labs? Then we will also see a lot of talk about robots. And again, brilliant educational tools, and I'm not 
opposed to them. But if I if I if I just look at Lego Mindstorms, uh, a one Lego Mindstorm robot is seven thousand rand, and the photo on the right hand kind of highlights the problem. If you have a class of forty, and I've seen this happen, you can't expect more than five to six learners interacting with one robot. So we're talking about eight robots in a class. Now they're not all seven thousand, but I'm just kind of highlighting the point. If you want Lego Mindstorms. You need to spend between 50 and 60,000 for a class of 40 to make it effective. I know they are cheaper robots, but once again, you, you can't have one robot for a class of 40. Um, these are my colleagues that have walked the road with me since um, January on the unplugged coding route. On the left is uh, Kelly Bush, who's been teaching coding to primary school learners at Hudson Park in East London. Selby Makuna is from Hazy View, who is doing excellent work in, in the rural circumstances regarding unplugged coding. Uh, now, I can't remember the name, can you believe it? <laughs> Leander from uh, Alexander Road is an IT teacher and one of the best well resourced schools in, in, at least in our city and probably in the province. And then Keith Gibson with me on the photo is, is a legend. He's been teaching computing at school since 1987. And we've all walked the road regarding um, unplugged coding this year. And when I heard that I'm presenting the talk, I just sent them a WhatsApp. Why should I say schools should not be using teaching, using computers to teach coding? And this is just some of the responses I got from them. Because a lack of access to adequate, adequate technology should not be a barrier to developing for IR skills. So if I'm currently looking at the, at the curriculum and if that's the only way of implementing the curriculum, it's a huge barrier to 70 to 80% of our learners. And if schools are gonna wait for the education department to provide these laboratories, not they may just be, they will be waiting forever. And I'm not putting blame on the Department of Basic Education I'm simply saying it's impossible. 16 billion rand, and you don't, don't just throw a lab into a school. You've got to give a person that can technically maintain the lab, build the networks, um, all of those things. How is any government going to do that for 16,000 schools, especially after a COVID pandemic where funds have been used in various other ways? And this is the critical thing. We're talking coding not because of coding we're talking computational thinking and computational thinking or problem solving if you want to call it that is much more about thinking than computers and computing and writing programs and software skills it's about thinking and that should be the core purpose of this uh, curriculum and then these skills, the skills that I've identified uh, late, earlier on, these skills of problem solving, computational thinking can be acquired whether you have computers or not. And that's the important thing I want to say. I think there's just too many schools that are waiting until they get a lab and until then they're not gonna do anything. But hopefully I'm gonna show you from what we've done that this does not need to be the case. And people might not agree with this, but I've done workshops across the country. I've seen teachers and computers really intimidate someone if they haven't done worked on it before. And especially if they have to start coding in Python or, or Scratch or Java, all the languages I'm hearing, they really intimidate it. Uh, and I've seen teachers and even DBE staff on my trips through the country leaving training sessions, totally despondent, and very anxious. Uh, do we really want that? If you look at these two photos, um, if we had time for interaction, I think you might see one of the other reasons why we should not use computers. On the left hand side, it's not a South African photo, but that's very typical. We've got kids sitting in front of a, of, of a screen, interacting with the screen, doing stuff, very fancy stuff, bling, but they're on their own. On the right hand side, we've got learners busy with unplugged coding activities in Soweto. Photo was taken 
back in about July this year. And just watch the body language. Uh, there's, there's, there's thinking and strategy and discussion and problem solving happening there just by watching the body language. I am kind of sure this is a school that does not have a computer laboratory. This is a, a quote I got from a graduate of ours. He coded in 1980, started at school, at a school that didn't have a computer, did a lot of programming without ever going into a lab, and is now a very senior IT person in the UK. And he says, a lecture room full of students, each behind a bright, shining, and busy screen with lots of enticing bells and whistles twinkling can merely serve towards lots of distraction and sometimes more confusion than is necessary. Remember, my, my kind of theory is that coding and teaching coding is about problem solving. It's about thinking. We're not producing software developers. And we need to be very serious with ourselves when you take a bunch of kids into a laboratory with a lot of screens, etc. How much thinking is happening? And, and is, that, is that the ideal scenario? Uh, I know Keith Gibson is listening and I warned him that I might pull him in at some stage later today. And he taught it called coding at one of the well-resourced schools in South Africa for a year last year without going into a lab. So why, do, why schools do not need computers? There's a difference between saying why they should not be using computers than to say, why do they not need computers? That's saying we can teach coding and thinking and problem solving without having computers. This is where I just want to talk on our Unplugged Coding project. Now, Unplugged Coding obviously is not our invention. That's well known. We all know about it. It's been used all over the world. Uh, we just kind of started with this project, mainly in, the big thing started four years ago, but this year it, it became bigger as an Unplugged Coding project. And I just want to give you some of the stuff that we've been doing. And, and this is the objectives of the project that we're involved with. And when I'm saying we, it's, the teachers I mentioned just now, um, facilitators all over the country, uh, in communities, in schools, etc. Unplug coding says you don't need computers and robots. You only we only use cell phones. You don't need electricity while you're presenting. You can only need you can charge the phones beforehand. You do not need internet connectivity. You download the app once and that's it. You need very basic training for a teacher to start. The training that we've done is four hours. It's very low budget compared to a million rand for a, a lab. A lot of the focus is on pen and paper and physical activities. I'll get now to the three apps that's kind of flagship tools in our project. And for us, the focus is on problem solving and computational thinking. It's also an introduction, obviously, to coding and robotics. But the focus is on problem solving and computational thinking. This is one of the activities that we do in our training and that uh, schools have been doing. The next few activities is just to introduce to a, to a, actually this is for foundation phase, but we always say, if a learner has done no coding before, whether he's in grade nine or grade one, you, you have to start at the same place. You can't start somewhere else. So this is just a list of posters that tells them where to put their shoe and where they position themselves to a chair, which is the basic understanding of what a program is. It's a list of instructions that tells a computer what to do. So you just, by the concept of demystifying is just introducing this concept to learners. And we have a lot of games that can be played with this. This is another one where they can reorder the posters uh, to tell someone how to make tea. And then there's daily tasks. And instead of giving them the posters, they draw the posters. I remember this is foundation phase, but I've done this with teachers. And I, I believe if you start with a grade nine class, it just makes just as much sense. So this is laying, laying the foundation of saying, what is a program? Uh, uh, it's mainly from our boats coding kit for foundation phase. And you've got these 10 topics related to coding where most of these topics, all of these topics are actually introduced with physical activities. And then they link to our Boats app, which I'll talk about later. Our Boats app is an app which does the basic Lego commands, move forward, turn left, turn right, etc. Uh, and the learners can interact with the app and then also with these activities. And then 
we, we do some uh, activities during the training, and I believe you can do this for two, three weeks, teaching learners what coding is, are the typical games that kids play. And there's many others. It's very interesting as I move through the country. Uh, there's traditional South African games that can be used. But these are the two well-known ones, Simon Says and Hopscotch. Both make, make use of, of instructions, a list of instructions and people responding. I heard this quote first from Keith Gibson. I'm not, I still need to ask him whether it's he is or whether he got it somewhere else. You cannot translate from English to French if you cannot speak English. Now, what we're saying here is there's no purpose in teaching coding if the learner cannot solve problems first. It's about problem solving. The coding is literally just a tool. And I'm, I'm kind of putting my head on the block. A lot of coding, which is web development, um, is simply just coding and getting a web page on. That's not problem solving. So we really need to think, what are we busy with uh, when we teach coding? Then you get computational problems like these, well, well known one where there's a lot of pen and paper activities on, on, on the internet available where the learners can interact just on pen and paper. And this one, they've got to use the different commands for the crane to swap the A and the B. And you can find these activities, hundreds of them, at coding.org or CS Unplugged. And I, I hope most of you are aware of that. And then our own um, talent search, IITPSA, Institute of Information Technology, South Africa, has a, a computer Olympiad once a year for computational logic, not for people that code. And there's many old exam papers there that can be used. This is a teacher here from Excelsior Primary in, in Kobecha. She went to Pinterest and find a lot of problem solving activities for her coding club. Uh, may I say an under-resourced school? And they've got a coding club twice a week with about 40 kids after school. And then they don't just code. They don't have computers in the school, by the way. Keith has developed this as, as 40 activities uh, for computational thinking, mainly for your senior primary school learners, I would say. And you can order this, for, you can email me and we'll forward this for you free of charge. It's 40 activities which Keith Gibson has developed. And then for the foundation phase, we've developed the storybook for solar energy. And there's a lot of activities in the storybook uh, that learners can interact with. I love this photo. This is from Hazy View. Selby Bakuna sent this to me, Makuna. These learners are waiting for their taxi. And they said they want to keep busy. And he gave them one of Keith's computational activities. And they were busy solving this activity while waiting for their taxi. I love this. And this is real. This is not posed. OK, I want to quickly introduce you to our tanks tool, which is our flagship tool. It was developed by Byron Batterson in 2017. Uh, in the tanks competition, there's 35 levels. You need to move the tank to the star using different commands. And I'm just going to play this short video so you get the idea behind the mechanism. So in this scenario, the tank needs to move backwards, turn left, and then move forward twice. So the learner packs out the code using the puzzle pieces, takes a photo of the code. When happy that it's the correct puzzle pieces that were recognized, you press yes and your tank moves. So what basically happens here is you're building your code through puzzle pieces, customized tokens, Take a photo, it internalizes the code through a QR code, and then the code executes on the cell phone. So, and what I've seen is when I've taken tanks to schools, what would be encouraged the schools to do is to take first take it into the physical world. So these are two learners. Uh, the one is from Kumcha in the Eastern Cape, and I can't remember the one. I think the right hand one is from Soweto where the learners first took the tank or whatever. On the left hand side, the, the, the learner becomes the tank and she moves through a grid, through commands. This is a quick video from Kayamandi, where we were teaching tanks and then the facilitator, the lady there holding the, the netball ball realized that these kids need to first see it in the physical world. So Easter Bunny was trying to reach the netball ball. And you'll see here the other kid is packing up the code for the Easter Bunny to get to the netball ball. So they keep it very practical. 
Right, so just one of the examples, this is level three in the game. So the tank needs to move forward. Sorry, I'm just gonna go there so I can actually move my tokens. The tank moves forward, uh, turns right, move forward, move forward. And now we've only given the kids three move forwards. Now they've got to think uh, out of the box. You can't turn right and move forward. So they learn very quickly to think out of the box, they turn left and they move backwards. Uh, and this is now, this is for on the screen, but in the real world, it will be puzzles which they take a photo and they'll see the tank actually moving. And for those who know coding, uh, we can introduce uh, the for loop or the repeat loop where the tank repeats, moves forward five times to get to the star or the while loop where they say, while, the, while my path is clear, keep on moving. So while there's no wall in front of me, the tank moves until it reaches the star. So we introduce the two loops constructs. We also have the nested loop construct um, or yeah. So in this case, you repeat three times and the thing that's re being repeated is another repeat which move, moves forward three times. So if you had time, I would ask you to for input, but this then uh, makes the tank move forward nine times. So you can see it gets quite complicated and it gets much more complicated by the time you reach level 35. And the tanks is also supplemented by a coding kit with lesson plans and instructional videos. Uh, if one coding kit will allow a teacher to offer coding to a class of up to 40. The only thing that's not provided in the coding kit is a cell phone. Uh, but we can talk about ways of how to doing that if you want more detail. We are currently working on, uh, on lesson plans for foundation phase and the senior phase with these four headings, all unplugged. Now, none of these need computers or physical robots. Algorithms and coding, design thinking and problem solving, computational thinking, digital citizenship. So we're taking the lesson plans that we currently have in the coding kits and Kelly Bush is working towards February next year to have 40 lessons for foundation phase and 40 for the senior phases, which covers these topics. And if I look at the curriculum, the only thing that we're not really covering is application skills. Now you can't teach Word and Excel if you don't have technology, but most of the other ones are covered in these topics um, and all unplugged. Just things that we can do with our games. We can have huge tournaments. On the right hand side, we were at Alexander Road in Koberga before COVID last year, and there were 120 learners participating. And I think a primary school team won that day. We see more and more coding clubs happening outside of school, after school, during breaks, over weekends, in communities by NGOs. Um, so this, this photo is from Tsomo in the Eastern Cape, where these learners get, got together every Saturday for a few weeks to teach coding, to do the tanks coding. We've done teacher training. Uh, I've done 50, 15 physical training workshops throughout the country and Vintuk this year, and then many more online workshops. And some of these workshops are available online if anyone is interested. This is the feedback, and this for me is the is the punchline. This is what teachers tell me after we've done them done tr uh, training. And remember, I've told you that what they feel like and this the emotions are when they come back from official Python and Scratch training, etc. And this is the kind of feedback I often get. It has demystified coding. Suddenly, they know what coding is. They now realize they don't need tech. So if they're sitting in a rural school up in a mountain, they can still teach coding. Many teachers see how they can integrate it into their class. If we have time, we can talk on that. Very important for me, 99% of the teachers leave the training with self-confidence. They're not scared to start. They know where to start. And they know because the training is fun. There's a lot of interaction. They know their learners will also enjoy it. And I've, I've, I receive photos daily from across the country where the learners play break time, during class, over weekends, etc. I want to just end off with uh, our video, which we've just uh, released this week. It's our new app called Rangers, which also has the additional theme of game poaching.
The Coding Game Rangers was developed to introduce learners to coding without the use of computers. But it goes much further than just introducing learners to coding. It also teaches them soft skills like group work, communication, strategy, problem solving. So what we do is we use a few cell phones and some customized tokens, visit schools where the learners then play for 45 minutes to an hour. And during these workshops, they introduce to coding, but we can also see the dynamics of group work. This can also take the form of a coding club at schools, where schools can run this weekly or daily without needing fancy and expensive computer laboratories. We've added to this game the concept of game poaching, and they literally have to try and save the rhino by catching the game poacher before the game poacher gets to the rhino. They also get information about game poaching in Africa. This way they are informed on environmental issues on our continent. I'm Jessica Domingo, I'm a section engineer at Elephant National Park. Uh, poaching has become a major issue through South Africa expanding into Africa. Um, we've got a large decline in both large herbivores, the elephant population has taken a large decline as well. Poaching is an important thing to uh, bring into education as a matter of importance as the youth today needs a clear understanding of what we do as management as well as the ground people. The children of today will unfortunately not see um, these large herbivores if we do not take a stand today in poaching. Okay, so that's our third app. I, I just put in the slide, so what? Uh, saying that I'm not, not, I'm, I'm not against laboratories. I don't say all schools must go and close their laboratories and sell their computers and burn them. Uh, I, I'm just saying we cannot, we cannot, we cannot leave behind, may I say 70% of the learners in our country because we have a curriculum that's dependent on a school that needs a computer laboratory that on average costs a million rand. It is totally politically insensitive. It is, doesn't make educational sense. And we just simply widening the, the digital divide. What we are gonna do if we go this route is to assist the well-resourced rich schools and simply just be, uh, leave behind the others. Do we really want this? I call it the fear of missing out. We know that. I'm calling it the anxiety of missing out. There are many teachers, parents, and learners that watch the news. They know they're in an environment where there's no computers. Can we really leave them just in a state of anxiety? I'm gonna end off with a slide, this video. The excitement is mounting. It will help me when I want to work at VW so that I can program the, ro the robots there at VW. And that's, our, that's our main goal as educators. We need to plant career dreams in young kids' lives so that this possible career is also one of the things they're going to work towards. They don't need to be software developers in primary school to become a software developer after varsity. They just need to be aware. They just need to be taught how to think and solve problems. Um, and that's our main, main theory. I, if you want to follow up, just things that you could follow up with me afterwards before I give you my contact details. Remember, I can send you Keith's computational thinking activities for free. You can talk to me about our apps. We've got single games and coding kits. Many of our un online unplugged coding workshops are recorded and available online. We did a whole series of four in June, and they're all available. If one's, people want to, more, want to have more detail about what I mean by unplugged coding, we often have virtual coding tournaments where learners code on their phones and scores come to a central base. I didn't talk too much about that. And there's also some links to some of our more information, our information videos. Thank you very much. This is my contact details. I'm going to leave it up for a while. Uh, if you want to contact me, um, my cell phone number is literally on every game that goes throughout the country. So my cell phone number is on probably 20,000 games at the moment. And I love getting photos from teachers and kids as they code. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to the, the chair. I'm gonna leave this up for a while and then we can open for some discussions.
Thank you so much, um, Jean, for such an amazing talk. And we've had some really powerful um, kind of realizations and insights that have come through from the chat. Uh, Nomusa, who is a happy recipient of um, a tanks kit is spending the weekend uh, looking at tanks and and she really agrees with you to say that we we've got dysfunctional or no computer labs even if the labs are there um, they can sometimes be very badly vandalized selby mcquenna uh, and and i'm going to quote directly from selby every child has a right to the same quality of education coding should not just be introduced um, to children with computer labs um, and a very powerful statement about leaving nobody behind as we enter into the fourth industrial revolution. So I'm certainly more empowered than I was um, less than an hour ago, but Professor Kroening, 25,000 students, 700 educators later, any mistakes that have been made along the way? Um, what would you do differently thinking over the last five years? Yeah, the, and I'm I'm blunt because I'm I'm an academic. <laughs> the, uh, the the first mistake I made in the first year was simply just to have workshops for kids, and then I give each one a game afterwards. Uh, that was our kind of driving force in the in 2018. Uh, and but then we realized, but this is an educational project. You you can't do this without teachers or community workers. So. From then on, we, we started in probably yeah, mid-2019, we said to ourselves, now we need to target the teachers first. So that, that 25,000 learners reaches probably in the first two years max. Because after 2019, we said, now this, this, this is fun and it's a good way to, nice story to tell, but we need to focus on educators. So that's when we came up with the coding kit and the lesson plans so that teachers could, could have something to, to go back into class. Because without the teachers, not much will happen. And when I'm saying that, I'm not saying the teacher needs to be a software developer. The teacher just needs to be a facilitator. In Kala, uh, east of Queenstown, for those who don't know where Kala is, the teacher facilitates that the kids can play over break. He's not there himself. They watch videos and they play. But you need a teacher. And then I realized, but... I can't just let the teachers watch the workshop and then expect they're going to do something. And this is where the training came in this year. This is where Keith and Selby and, uh, and Kelly and Leander was stationed came in. So we, we're now focusing on training teachers. Um, and our training sessions has been four or five hours physical. And online, we've had one long session of four Tuesday afternoons, hour each. So that was the main thing. And then I'm, what I'm also realizing is, and I can't, I can't solve this one, coding is not part of the curriculum yet. So teachers simply don't have time during the day, uh, even the pilot schools. No, not much is happening at the pilot, most pilot schools. Um, so we need to focus, and I'm trying to focus on the concept of coding clubs, like chess clubs or whatever, after school. And then may I say our biggest successes have been NGOs. Those uh, passionate driven people that work in communities, uh, they, they've really carried the flag. But I'm not blaming teachers. I know teachers are too busy. Uh, but one needs to, and we're busy now here yeah, in Kobeja, creating the concept of a coding club after school. It's, it's currently a voluntary exercise. Until it's not in the curriculum, it's never going to be compulsory. So yeah, that's the, the path that we've walked. I've just written an article on that. That's why I kind of know the process. Thank you very much. And uh, we've certainly got quite a few questions coming through uh, from Zed Machoba. Um, and, and I think Machoba, I know where you're from, which is Yamazwi, our sister literary institution. His question, I wonder if there's a similar thing for literature, coding and playing games to catch words or characters. How is it possible to code for literature? Okay, I'm um, just bluntly ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> there, there must be something. I'm not aware of something, um, but the, it must be possible to develop something like that. But I, I just at this stage don't have the capacity. One could probably Google and find out whether there must be something or someone on, in this group might know. 
but sorry, I'm not going to try and make as if I know. <laughs> I don't know. No, it's all good. Thank you so much. Uh, Louis van der Merwe um, inspired Mashoba to say, if you can imagine it, you can code it to happen. So there you go. Um, there's already a sense to say, yeah, if there's a problem, it can be, it can be solved. Um, there's a question from Harit Boerter. Uh, great talk, uh, Prof. Halen. I'm teaching coding in Dunoon, just outside Cape Town, but will change my strategy after listening to this. I'm just wondering how you do a migration from a non-computer, sorry, I've just lost the, the chat, um, from a non-computer interface set up to a computer interface, because that's what would be needed at a point, algorithms just get too complex. Yes, obviously, uh, uh, but um, we've had to make that decision when we started that saying that's not our mandate at this stage. Uh, I think there's educational guys that will know how to do that. I, I've seen it with my first years at varsity. Once I can physically see a loop uh, with a tank moving on the screen, those kind of concepts in, in um, textual programming becomes more sensible. So the the, the I would say the logical process would be if you have a lab uh, is, is tanks and then maybe scratch and then go into textual code that that because scratch is kind of the thing after tanks tanks is a much more basic thing than scratch uh, but I'm always very hesitant when I talk about this because now the teachers that don't have labs will say oh there we stuck but I have to emphasize that your responsibility as a school is not to teach them coding your responsibility as a school is to teach them how to solve problems. And even if that kid never again sees a computer until matric or until first year, if you can teach that learner to solve problems, to think strategically and place that career dream in their minds, you've done enough for a school that doesn't have a lab. Don't give up before you've done that part. I want to emphasize that. I've got a, a student that came to study us from Mount Frere, read Da Vinci Code, in grade nine, where she just read about algorithms, which inspired her to become a, a graduate five years later while at a school with no computers. So yes, if you have computers, go the full route. If you don't have computers, do the problem solving route first and don't give up. It's more important than teaching them how to write Python. Thank you very much. Uh, Namusa has a question. When teachers are trained on orientation of coding and robotics curriculum, the majority were intimidated with all the jargon that came with the CNR curriculum. How do you find it, Prof? And, and also, how do you make it more accessible? Because yeah, jargon can be very exclusive, um, especially in the in the technology fields. I've been talked to. I've been told to be politically sensitive when I answer this question, but I've decided not to. The current curriculum is just so overloaded that it doesn't make sense. Uh, and I've told people from DB, it's not gonna be implemented. Uh, so don't be intimidated by all the jargon in that curriculum. It's just so overloaded that I feel sorry for the poor DBE guys that have to roll this out. And then even more sorry for the poor teachers. It's just not gonna happen. Uh, I'm still looking for a pilot school where it's been implemented successfully. Maybe there's a few but I've met many more where there's nothing happening. Um, so my basic concept is focus on unplugged coding, demystify coding first, before you go and read that curriculum. Um, and, I, and I'm blunt about, I wrote a letter to Cyril Ramaphosa when it came out, I couldn't stand it. Um, and I think DBE needs to revisit that curriculum and talk to educationists. I, I don't know who was behind this curriculum, it's just to overload it and it's not going to serve the purpose. So please, teachers, do we not be intimidated by the curriculum? Um, Thank you very much. Some very plain speaking. Um, Pendile is asking, can a school or a district request you to do workshops for their teachers? Yeah, that's, that's a tricky one. I was on sabbatical when I did the workshops in the first six months. So I, I could do a lot of traveling. At this stage, we try to do it online so they can talk to me. Everything that's in the workshop is available in four one hour online sessions. Where possible, I could still try and visit schools, but um, there's no way I can do 15 like I did in the first six months when I was in sabbatical. But talk to me, there are ways to getting started. 
And maybe just the way that we work is we work mainly with corporate sponsors. So where schools don't have budgets, um, we try and get corporate sponsors so that we can send the kids to them at no cost. Thank you very much. So Pandila, just get in touch with, with Professor Hreilung and there will be hopefully a way that you guys can, can get access to this incredible opportunity. So I think that the, the point about problem solving coming before coding is, is a fundamental one. And, and as you've said, schools need to locate themselves quite successfully where they are. We've got a couple of people who've raised hands in the participant group. Um, so what we'd like to do in our last couple of minutes um, is actually just unmute them and invite them to, to ask you the questions directly. Just to save time, we won't uh, turn videos on because it, it does create a little bit of a delay. So, um, uh, Lehako uh, Mapela, please excuse my pronunciation if it's incorrect. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. We've not got too much time left, so if you could keep it crisp, we'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you, sister. Uh, no, you know, here in the Eastern Cape, and I'm sure even in other provinces, the government has brought some young people here uh, who know nothing, of course, about coding, I asked them, to, to teach learners coding. There are few computers that they are given every day. They try to teach this coding. But now I think this way of doing things, it's bad. I want to agree with you. And uh, are you planning to work with the Department of Basic Education and bring this program to school anytime soon. Just collaborate with the, uh, or are you working privately? Thank you, uh, leadership. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to say too much, but I am talking to DBE and different departments. Um, I think I think the reality of, of the curriculum and needing computers, et cetera, is busy to dawn onto people. So yes, we, we are we are talking, but um, yeah, government is a long process. Indeed, but thank you very much for that feedback. So watch this space. Uh, hopefully there'll be some, some quick progress in that regard. I see there's a hand from Tokazile Mateza. Um, please go ahead and ask, ask your question, Tokazile. Tokuzile, you're muted. Would you mind unmuting? Just a warning. I'm I'm got load shedding at four, so I might go yeah. off if we're still okay. busy at four. I'll try and come back as soon as possible. All right. So uh, Tokuzile is not responding at the moment, um, so we'll we'll move on. I think that pretty much brings us to the end, unless there are any others that have come through. So I think given that load shedding is imminent, and I think you raised a very important point, uh, Prof, in your presentation to say that you don't need electricity um, to do this program. <laughs> and I think that's what we all need at the moment. Uh, it's just for me to say thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, thank you all to the audience for joining us as well. We had a lot of folks uh, who probably couldn't join us because of load shedding. So please, uh, we will be putting our recording up on our Facebook page and on our website as almost as soon as the session is over. So it will be available and accessible. Please share it widely. And of course, uh, Professor Hreiling has shared his contact details as well. So Professor, I'm sure you will be getting an enormous number of emails immediately. Um, so brace yourself. And <laughs> Uh, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. And from SciFest Africa and the SciFest Africa team, thank you again. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. That was great interacting. Thanks.